Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be located, folks. It's another time together. And the information that we all bring together is something that we feel that's super important for you. And tonight, there's nothing better than having somebody who has dedicated their life to solving ALS coming to visit you this evening. So welcome, Clive, Casey. I think we might have um, uh, announcement on our research if uh, Sylvia is right here. Okay, if she's not here, it's okay. Casey, take it over. Or K Kristen, do you wanna talk about the? Um, yes, actually, um, Dave asked earlier, and I wanna kind of get back to that about his daughter's newly diagnosed. Um, what are some things he can do? And we have a study. Um, you get all of your data back. It's very powerful. And I'm going to share my screen for just one moment so you can see the poster. I'll also tag you in it in Facebook if she has Facebook. Um, but it's a multi multidisciplinary study um, with cognition, motor, and respiratory. It's done from the comfort of your own home. Um, it's done by a smartphone. And um, I'm assuming your daughter probably has a smartphone, but we still provide one. And you can take all of this information to your clinic. You can track yourself. Um, and all you have to do to join, I'll pop the email in the chat. Of course, there's a learn more. But if you'll send me her name, I'll also tag her in Facebook, if you don't mind. And if you have any questions, um, I'll also put my email. I had a question to ask about that. Um, mm -hmm. Is that study available to people outside of the U.S. as well or no? Um, not currently. Um, if you have a U.S. address, um, we would love to have you join us um, because it's very, very powerful because it's yours. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions on this study? Yeah, I have one. Sure. Um, so I'm part of the city, and I'm still waiting for my data. There's no feet data. Uh, there's no speech data available. And the breathing data, you constantly have to ask to get actually a PDF. When will we have access to our data? Um, that's a really great question. And we are hoping that the patient portal will be ready for you, Andy. Would you like to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, this Friday. We're releasing it this Friday. So um, the reason why it took a little longer is, you know, the feed me data needed to be um, the walking stride data needed to be a little bit more quality checked. So um, we have it. We have it ready by end of this week, and we're going to uh, update you on what the data is and how to read it. Thank you, Paul, for the great question. Thank you. Uh, will you, Will you send out links to the participants? Because I have a. I just so happens I have a neurology appointment on Tuesday, and I'd yes. love to be able to bring some of that data, especially Perfect. around my my walking, because that's been an area we've had a really hard time uh, figuring out my progression. And this yes. would be wonderful yeah. data to have. Perfect. Dom, we'll, we will send send it to you before your um, appointment. I wasn't able to look in the chat, so I hope I didn't miss a question. Um, it looks like I'm good. Casey, um, if there's no more questions, and again, if you wouldn't mind, if you want me to tag you in it in Facebook or send this to you by email or follow up in any way, I'll make sure you have all that information in the chat before I leave. Um, Casey, would you like to go ahead and introduce our speaker? Yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our expert talk series. Our speaker for tonight will be Dr. Clive Svensson. Dr. Clive Svensson's predoctoral training was at Harvard University, and he received his PhD from the University of Cambridge in England. In 2000, he moved to the University of Wisconsin as professor of neurology and anatomy and founded their stem cell and regenerative medicine center. In 2010, he moved to Los Angeles and founded the Cedar sinai Board of Governors Regenerative Medicine Institute, which currently has over 30 faculty members. 
Dr. Svensson maintains a large lab that focuses on using patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cells to model diseases, including SMA, Parkinson's, and ALS. He was the sponsor for the first ever clinical trial delivering stem cells engineered to release GDNF to the spinal cord of ALS patients, which met the tr trial endpoint of safety. He is also the sponsor for an ongoing trial delivering these same cells to the motor cortex of ALS patients. Please join me in welcoming our amazing speaker, Dr. Clive Svensson. Okay, thanks very much. Let me start sharing my screen. Yes. All right, look good? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, wonderful to be here, see so many people. Uh, virtually, of course, um, and going to today talk about uh, really some updates in, in two different areas. Uh, first, my disclosures, as I talk, uh, we are interested in, and have some interest in a company called Emulate that I'll talk about. I'm on the DSMB, actually chair for Novartis for uh, gene therapy, and I'm on the scientific board of Coir Therapeutics, which I'll also mention. So two things I'm going to talk about. In the first 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about Something you don't think about so much uh, in when you think of stem cells in ALS, but it's, I think, going to be very important. And then I'll update you on our clinical trials using stem cells to treat ALS that some of you probably know about that I discussed at a previous uh, Everything ALS meeting. I'm really just going to there briefly discuss the trial and the other stem cell trials like Brainstorm that are going on um, and then discuss where we're at with our trial. So <clears throat> start off to try and get everybody in the same place with stem cells. Um, I'm not going to do the, the long version of the talk, just to talk about many different types of stem cells you can get, but just focus first off uh, on the most powerful stem cell. It's called an embryonic stem cell. Um, and this is a stem cell that occurs in the, in the inner cell mass of de developing embryos. All humans, uh, when they're about 12 days old, look like this. There are a bunch of cells in a circle here, and then the inner cell mass are very <laughs> important cells. They're going to give rise to the whole human body. And they're called pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells. Those could be divided forever in the petri dish and make all the tissues uh, of the human body. This is really, really an exciting type of cell. But as many of you know, uh, all the way back to George Bush, there's been many issues over using human embryos for research or fetal tissue um, because it involves strong uh, moral and ethical problems, to be frank. It's, uh, it's something that's been very complex in the US to, to get through. And in fact, as you know, Bush. The NIH is a major funder for stem cell research uh, and way back uh, had banned in 2001 the use of embryonic stem cells by the NIH, National Institutes of Health, who do most of our funding. Well, <clears throat> along comes President Obama, and as many of you know, uh, he actually reversed that ruling and then allowed NIH to fund stem cell research using embryos again back in 2009. Uh, I was at the University of Wisconsin then, go Badgers. Uh, and at that time, we were very excited and very involved in embryonic stem cell research. Uh, and actually, if you look carefully, this is me right here, uh, taking a picture. And if I can prove it because I've still got the bald spot here, the back of my head, but uh, not gone any further, thank goodness. But uh, that was a very exciting day for everybody. Uh, and in fact, a new discovery though, really made this all irrelevant. Uh, this is the most remarkable discovery in biology probably. Uh, that is of course, as many of you probably know, something called induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, what are induced pluripotent stem cells? These cells we can take from anybody uh, on this call, any age. Uh, we take the skin cells or the blood cells from the body, adult cells, and these, in, in this case, I'm just showing skin cells. We add proteins to these cells that make them go, uh, make them change. Uh, the main protein there is that we use is called OCT4. And in fact, uh, funnily enough, October 4th now in the US is called pluripotency day because of OCT4 Oct is the molecule that makes cells go back in time. So uh, if you give this one, pro one factor OCT4 along with some other factors, but mainly OCT4, what happens is your adult cells go back in time to this pluripotent state. So now we have a cell that's, that's pluripotent, but it came from an adult cell. Now this cell is pretty much identical to these embryo stem cells that we all know about from human blastocysts, so human uh, uh, fertilized eggs. Um, so now we have a pluripotent cell that's almost identical to an embryonic stem cell, 
but it, we made it from an adult and we can make it from any one of you. And I'll tell you about a story where we've made it from a thousand patients with ALS. Now, why are we interested in this pluripotent cell? Because we can now do the same thing as we do with embryonic stem cells. We can take this pluripotent stem cell and turn it into heart cells, brain cells, or immune system cells. And of course, for ALS, we're very interested in turning it into the motor neurons that die in the disease. And until we're discovering, this is for my, for my lab, the science is like turning lead into gold. We thought old cells, you know, we couldn't use those to make neurons for sure that are in the brain, but now we can using this technology. So it really has huge implications. We can now generate young cells from any tissue from individuals. And they're also, by the way, perfectly matched to you. So if we created a motor neuron and made it go into the spinal cord and project to the muscle, it's a long uh, process and we're not quite there yet, but that would be possible to use one's own stem cells to make motor neurons. And that's an idea that is still um, going around, but it's very hard to get those motor neurons to connect back to the muscle right now, but it's possible. Uh, but more importantly, in, in immediate terms, we can model disease in the dish. And that's what I'm going to talk about. By the way, the guy that discovered this was actually a Japanese orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and he got the Nobel Prize very rapidly. And one of the shortest Nobel Prizes, discovery to Nobel Prize ever for this technology. Uh, and there is an animal that's actually immortal that uses this technology itself. This is the jellyfish uh, in the Pacific. When the Pacific gets cold, the jellyfish goes actually back in time, back to an embryonic state. And when the Pacific warms up again, it goes forward and ages. And it uses this mechanism, OC4, we think, to reprogram itself back and go forwards again. So this is the, the only immortal animal on Earth that we know about. And some of them supposedly have lived up to two to 3,000 years. Wow. And of course, when a baby comes by and the propeller goes, you're done. <laughs> it's not bionic, uh, but it definitely can live for a long time. So to me, this whole technology is, uh, for those of you who know H.G. Wells and the time machine, it really reminds me of this wonderful machine that this guy has where you can take things back in time. So now we can take cells back in time, guys. And, and believe me, this is a fascinating and an amazing story. Now what you're looking at are my heart cells. Um, and I never thought I'd see my heart cells beating in a dish. But it turns out I've made my own IPS line, induced pluripotent stem cell line, and the lab turned these cells into beating cardiomyocytes. It takes about 13 days. So you take, you have a pluripotent cell and you then give it the right cocktail of, of ingredients and it turns into a beating cardiomyocyte. And we're using this in our institute to look at heart disease arrhythmias because if the patient had an arrhythmia in the heart, the beating of this heart cells would also have an arrhythmia and the chemistry that goes along with it. And that's very powerful because now you can add drugs to these beating cells, right? And see if it affects the arrhythmia. You haven't touched the patient <laughs> and the patient is the patient's own cells. So the concept for ALS is if we have the patient's motor neurons in the dish and they're from the same patient, you could test drugs on these motor neurons in the dish. And then that drug might have an effect on that motor neuron in the patient. And this is the concept of disease modeling. Now we don't want to make heart cells in, in my lab. We, we actually want to make neurons. So we take our induced pluripotent stem cells and we essentially model normal brain development. And the brain goes again from this uh, uh, embryo here all the way through to the spinal cord. And then you make the spinal cord column. And here are the beautiful motor neurons that develop in the spinal cord. And what we do is in the dish, the Petri dish, we model this whole process from beginning to end. It's quite remarkable, but we can model it pretty well. The timing goes along almost with normal development. So at the end of it, you get these beautiful motor neurons coming out um, that look very similar to the human spinal cord shown here. So we can essentially make your spinal cord model, your spinal cord neurons, motor neurons in the Petri dish. And, and that's, what, that's what we do in the lab. Like a brain biopsy. So we, this isn't, we're not taking a piece of your brain, don't worry. We take your skin cell, convert it, or your blood cell and convert it. And then we make that into your neurons. So it's like a biopsy. And now we want to test if they're different in between ALS and control. And we hope that if we can find this difference, um, we'll be able to test drugs on this. But also maybe, you know, one person's ALS is not the same as another person's ALS. It's ALS. And you all know the, uh, the complex biology of ALS, and it's true that over 10% of ALS is caused by specific genetic mutations. We know that, like C9ORF or SOD1. But the other 85 to 90% of ALS is what we call sporadic. It doesn't mean that there could be many causes for different subtypes of ALS, and that's what we hypothesize as a group when we thought about um, looking into how to um, understand more about ALS using this modeling system. 
in the early days, I'm not going to show any data, and I'm going to try and keep this high level because I'm really focusing uh, on on the audience who doesn't really know all the, the deep biology. So forgive me if I show a few slides that have data in, but I'm just going to summarize it for you. Uh, the first paper we we published in this area was with Robert Baylor. Bob Baylor, many of you know, uh, is now at Roche, uh, a great colleague and friend of mine who was at Cedar Sinai. We essentially took C9 off patients, made iPS cells, and made motor neurons. And what we found in this paper was those motor neurons did have the pathology you see in C9 off in the Petri dish. And that was very exciting because it was the first evidence that we can actually model ALS in the Petri dish. And then this is a huge collaboration with really colleagues, Merit Chukovic, uh, Jeff Rothstein, and a, and a bunch of clinicians and a bunch of researchers, Leslie Thompson, Ernest Frankel, uh, who all got together to start Answer ALS. And you can go to answerals.org. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have heard of Answer ALS. Uh, before and essentially, we the goal is very ambitious. Five years ago, when we started this, but we were going to take a thousand patients with ALS, um, put them, give them each a GUID, a, a unique identifier, um, and then collect their blood samples from all over the world. And these are the blood samples contain the adult blood cells that we're going to reprogram and turn into motor neurons. And we're going to ask is if we do look at this data, can we find subtypes? So the first job is to send this blood off to New York Genome Center. And we're trying to get as much information as we can in this, in this uh, program. So the first thing is to make, um, is to look at the DNA. So we can do DNA sequencing. So now we get the genome sequence. And then the second part of this in a, in a very similar building, but in green, uh, this is Cedar sinai Medical Center. Uh, this is where the magic happens. And, and our lab and the core IPS core we developed here will make the IPS cells. And then we're turning them into the motor neurons. So now we have all the motor neurons linked to the genomics. And at the same time, all the clinics are collecting a lot of data from the patients, including wearables, uh, progression of disease, and all of that uh, information. All of that goes into a, a in information system. We call it the Answerailers portal. And again, that's all online now. And what we're looking for within all of this data is a signature that defines subpopulation of patients. So the goal is we had four different colors of patient going in and think of this as four different flavors of ALS that have different causes. Through all of this, we come out the other end with a signature. And of course, the goal is to understand the signature. And we've been working with big names to try and figure this out, um, including Google and IBM at the early days. But ultimately, this is for the high level floor, is if we can find this signature, so we now have blue, orange, red, and green types of patients, we then test drugs on the motor neurons to see in those subtypes, do we get an effect of a specific drug? And now, uh, this is the magic, is that drug then <clears throat> is given to the appropriate patient. Not one drug for all of the patients, but the drug that worked in our model will be given back to the patient. <clears throat> and this is the big view. Uh, I could talk for a long time about a lot of the uh, uh, breakthroughs that are coming in this area. For instance, Justin Achida has got some modeling now that is actually doing this in smaller groups of patients. Uh, and he's he's got some exciting data there. It needs to be reproduced by other groups. And we're all trying to do that. Um, Hideyuki Okano in Japan has had some nice data showing this model modeling system works as well. We're not the only ones doing this. Um, we're still all trying to reproduce each other's data. That's what you have to do in science to see you know how reliable is it across different nationalities, particularly different uh, scientific groups, and how robust is it? So if you have a paper with you published, you then have to test it in patients and show that you've really got something that models a disease. Now we're all getting closer and we're all very excited. Um, I just put this up to acknowledge <laughs> that the group um, that does this work, and this is a, a, one of the largest collaborations that I've been involved with. And Jeff and I back at the end here, we're really kind of, we kind of shepherd everything around and trying to, Keep, keep organizational control with very much an equal equal contribution from all these amazing researchers that come into uh, Answer ALS. And we're, we're very excited that this resource now is coming up online. Uh, Leslie Thompson and myself, who's another key member of the group, published this paper recently, uh, just a few, uh, just last year, or just this year actually, really showing the very first data that came out of this program. And I'm not gonna go into any detail other than to say, um, we saw after we reprogrammed, we just looked at the first uh, 433 IPS lines. Just to give you, a, give you an idea, most papers that are published maybe use three lines or five lines. Uh, so using 300, 433 lines is a massive study. And we can only do this because of answer ALS. We actually took the first shot at, you know, is there a subtype? And the first question we asked actually was, can we even tell, you know, ALS from control? 
And it turned out it's not as simple as we thought. The biology seems to be fairly complicated. Um, so we didn't get a, a smoking gun like, oh, here's all the ALS and here are all the controls on the first run. But we did pick up some very interesting uh, features that we call variables that are they're actually adapting a change in the data that we're looking at we hadn't expected. And the first one is, is here. The first one is, we didn't expect this. This came out of the data. It turns out that male and female motor neurons are very different. We didn't think they would be because at that stage of development, you'd think a motor neuron is a motor neuron, right? It's got rid of all the sex differences. No, uh, male no motor neurons are different. Uh, there's actually more motor neurons from male iPS cells than from female iPS cells. They're different biologically. And so it's really given us this thought that we should be looking at male and female motor neuron disease as two different types of disease, and maybe they'll respond differently to drugs. And that's really important for the field because we often focus clinical trials with mixed numbers of males and females, or maybe your drug works just in males and not in females. And we don't power our clinical studies to, to allow for that. Of course, we can always look at that post-drug, and if you saw something very dramatic, you'd pick it up perhaps, but it's not something we routinely think about. Um, I told you about the motor neurons, more motor neurons in the male cultures, um, and uh, the main part of this data is this is just the first look. We have a lot of omics. Uh, we put this uh, data now online. There are hundreds of people examining it as I speak. And we're hoping that through this resource of all these motor neurons from all these patients, people will start discovering things that we couldn't find on a first look uh, by combining a lot of the data that we have in this resource. And we're very excited to uh, have that out there. So uh, that's kind of the, uh, the answer ALS part of, of the talk. Um, but we, you know, we, we're just putting these cells in a two-dimensional culture at the moment. We just stick the neurons, motor neurons in the dish and, and take a look. Yeah. The real question I ask is what if we could uh, be a little more sophisticated? And uh, this is in collaboration with the WIS Institute. Don Ingber and I met a number of years ago. And what they developed is this amazing uh, chip model. And in this case, you're looking at what's called lung on a chip. And now this is a tiny, tiny, it's only this big. It's a tiny little um, plastic device. And in the lung on a chip, you put the lung cells on the top and you put the, the blood cells or the blood vessel cells on the bottom. And then what happens is this, is this lung on a chip actually breathes. They have a vacuum channel that can pull, stretch, like lung needs to breathe. And then what's very clever with this uh, system, and it's the Emulate company now that produced this, is in the lung chip, and they've used this in COVID, and we've used it in COVID studies, you can pump air through the top channel and you can uh, put actual patient blood through the bottom channel. And... What's quite remarkable is when you, uh, this is just a cartoon, in the lung, you can actually simulate a bacterial infection. So those of you who have bacterial infection, what happens is the bacteria get onto the lung, you can see sticking there, and they activate the lung surface. And now the blood cells rolling through the bottom will sense the bacteria stuck on the top and they'll go through these little pores in the membrane and they'll kill the bacteria. And that's wonderful. And that's, now that's modeled completely in this lung chip and it's very, very exciting, it's being used again, has been used in COVID, and it's being used now to model a lot of diseases that affect the lung. Now you see the real cells, these are labeled with something called GFP. They uh, see the, they sense the uh, um, bacteria on the top of the chip, and you're watching them flow through the bottom channel. Now we got a microscope, we watch an individual, um, it's called a macrophage, that sense something's going on on the top of the chip. It crawls through a little hole to get to the top where the infection is. And once it gets up to the top, it's now going to do something quite remarkable. It's just going to attack the bacteria <laughs> and take it out. So this has modeled the entire infection process in the lung. And what I asked and we asked a few years ago is could we actually use this to do the same thing to model ALS uh, in the dish? Uh, this is the platform. It's actually no tubing, so remarkably, it's like science fiction. It has an orb thing here to pump fluid, pump air through the, uh, through the system. Uh, and they're focusing on neuroscience as well at emulate and We've, we've been working with a company for a while to kind of understand how we can use this with our models. So I showed you this earlier on. We know we can take induced pluripotent stem cells. We can make them into these motor neurons here that look very similar to the spinal cord. Um, but what we also want to do is a bit more clever than that, not just the motor neurons. What if we could make the blood vessels that lie in the brain, the so-called blood-brain barrier? Because often we want to model uh, the whole system, not just the cells. So it turns out through some help from my colleague in Wisconsin, uh, Lippmann, and Schuster, Eric Schuster, uh, we managed to collaborate. We got together and we made what's called BMECs, and these are brain microvascular uh, cells that actually mimic the blood-brain barrier, mimic the cells that line the brain vessels that are seen here 
these are the cells in the brain, and now look, we've made them in the petri dish. So now the beauty is we can combine those two things. Um, and in fact, what we do is in these chips shown here, we put blood through one side of the chip and we can have the brain on the other. We can actually create a hemorrhage and show that the blood will flow through the chip onto the brain side. So we kind of create a hemorrhagic stroke. But the beauty also is we can now flow blood through the blood side that has drugs in it that might treat ALS, like Rilazol, for instance, the studies we're doing now, the Amalex drug, and see how it gets through the blood brain barrier and also see how it affects the neurons on the other side. And I think this flow is very important. It nutrients, uh, it's like the real living brain condition. And we can also sample and get biomarkers like neurofilament from the blood side or the brain side to see how the neurons are reacting. And then that will predict more what might happen in the clinical trial. Uh, this is the first, uh, Sam Sans is in my lab, the first spinal cord chip that we developed. Um, and it's in 3D here. You can see on the bottom now, it's looking through the chip, you've got lots of blood vessels around the bottom, blood cells. And on the top are the beautiful neurons, motor neurons that die in ALS. And so we've managed now to create a chip that uh, is close to what we were calling the ALS chip. Uh, and it's going to provide a lot of information. We, it's electrophysiologically active. It makes fires action potential. So that's what neurons in the brain need to do. And we know that these neurons are active. And in fact, again, you saw my heart beating earlier on. Well, now you're seeing my brain functioning. <laughs> these are my iPS cells made into neurons. And we're measuring calcium input to the neuron. So as it thinks and decides and makes a signal, it takes up calcium. And we're detecting that in the system. So every green flash there is a, is a neuron that's suddenly fired and is taken up calcium. Uh, my dean shows this uh, meeting. He says it just proves that Clive has a brain, which I think is very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll finish there with the modeling, guys. It's just giving you a flavor for the kinds of things we're doing. Uh, there's a lovely article that was published in National Geographic, if you get that journal. Um, that's my graduate's hand on the front. And we talk about all the potential of this uh, technology combined with iPS cells. We're really now uh, starting to see differences, not the Justin Pachita lab, there's, there's uh, Jeff Rothstein, there's our lab. And I think as we get more and more sophisticated in developing these models, we're starting to see more and more Chain no, differences James. between ALS and so that's very exciting because once we get there, we can start applying drugs and really trying to subgroup the patients and, and get more advanced in our clinical trials. We can really run blood through the bottom channel and, and do a clinical trial on the chip, and that's the uh, great hope is that we can predict uh, how the drugs may work and, and get closer to this precision health. Now, I have to tell you all this is research at the moment, and I think the big roadblock, <clears throat> the challenge for all of us in the field. It's really validating these exciting models. So I can talk to you about all the science and it looks great, but what we now need to do is get to validation step. And that means taking this technology, running a clinical trial and proving that what you said would happen in the dish actually works in patients. And I know with Merit Djokovic and, and Jeff and I, we talk a lot about trying to you know, set up some of these very novel trials and integrate this IPS technology, for instance, into the platform trial, the Healy platform trial and NGH. Uh, Merit and I are often chatting about how can we integrate this? When's the right time to integrate it? It's expensive technology. It costs a lot of money to grow these cells and the chips, et cetera. Um, but you have to, at some point, take that dive, do the investment, and so understand if that advanced modeling can help with uh, prediction of clinical trials. So, okay, that's my uh, first part of the talk. <clears throat> I'm willing to take questions uh, when I finish the second part. But I think this is a part that many people are excited about. And just to remind everybody, um, we have, uh, I've done this, I think this is my third one, actually. I couldn't find the first one online, uh, uh, so I'll, 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 maybe that's already gone, but I did do one uh, a number of years ago. And on the stem cell front, you heard a great talk, and you can go back and look at that. This is why I love everything ALS, because they will keep their talks up online. So you can go back, take a look at this from Matt and Star. It really tells you about mesenchymal cells, and I'll mention that in a second, um, and how they've been used. Uh, Neurone, which is on everybody's lips right now, and I'll talk about that in a second, was uh, was well, very well dis uh, described by uh, Dr. Namita Goyal recently as well. And Stan Appel, friend, colleague, <clears throat> gave a great talk on a, another type of cell-based therapy for ALS, and I'll, I'll briefly describe that as well. And I really, what I thought today is to get you caught up, really, on where we are as of today on these different types of stem cell. And the mesenchymal cell comes from the bone marrow, um, and the T cells are already in your blood. None of these, none of these use embryonic stem cells. And, I, well, and I'll tell you, 
And One is so, based so these, by uh, Dr. Appel. He's talking about oh. right there. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I think, that, I think For somebody needs to mute me. Oh, there you go. So let's start with Brainstorm. Um, <clears throat> now, Brainstorm uh, have uh, recently completed a phase three trial, as many of you know. Just the technology, guys, is from their website. Is They take a bone marrow uh, aspirate. They put it into tissue culture. They grow the cells up. They then expand them. Um, they, they then differentiate them into a specific type of mesenchymal cell that I actually, actually seems to um, produce more GDNF, which I'll come to in, in our trial as well. So it's a GDNF secreting mesenchymal cell. Um, and then they put that cell into the CSF, the lumbar spinal cord. It's like a lumbar puncture in reverse. They inject the cells into the CSF, which is the, the fluid which bathes the outside of your brain. Okay, so this is a, a peripheral cell, a mesenchymal cell, that then is put back into the spinal cord. And in the original uh, top line results from their phase three, you know, it goes phase one, phase two, phase three, brainstorm invest an enormous amount of time and money. Uh, it's a very well thought through trial. Uh, they did uh, publish this uh, phase three study, and unfortunately, it didn't meet its primary endpoint. And, and that is usually a death knell for drugs, and that's why we do a big phase three. Um, but when they looked in subgroups, they did find some interesting results. Um, and they've also found biomarkers in the CSF. And these are molecules which are responding to the mesenchymal cells that they put in. And so it seems like the cells are doing something in the CSF. They're releasing factors and they're taking out factors from the CSF that may in turn have some effect on disease uh, progression. Now, remember, these cells are not being put into the brain tissue itself. They're being put into the support CSF through the spinal fluid. Uh, and are thinking to have the mechanism of action is that they're affecting somehow the CSF. Well, very unfortunately, the uh, FDA, or fortunately, depending on which side of this argument you're on, uh, they had a, a, a review by the FDA just a few weeks ago. I went to that, and it was a very interesting discussion. <clears throat> and it just seems like, from the FDA's perspective, there were some deficiencies. Uh, and ultimately, the FDA and the advisory group, and this is just the advisory part, they set up an advisory meeting to get input, kind of voted down uh, uh, approving this because the phase three trial uh, showed that there wasn't an effect uh, at the gross level and, and the uh, sub effects that they saw the FDA argue weren't quite enough to take this to market and give it approval. And so that was the outcome of, of the brainstorm trial. The official note from FDA is still to come. They could still decide to approve it, but they've had the advice from this panel of 17 people that probably it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a good thing to approve it because they weren't convinced that it really worked well enough. Now, that's that's the argument, and I understand uh, there's a lot of passion about stem cells uh, in ALS. Uh, I actually didn't attend, I didn't wasn't on the panel uh, purely because I didn't want to get in, into any conflicts of interest given we're doing stem cell trials, so I wasn't on the panel, but I listened to the discussion. I thought it was a good discussion, uh, and I think ultimately we want to have drugs there that really have a strong effect in ALS because this is you know, a complex treatment as well. You have to have cells injected into the spinal fluid. So that was the outcome of this. And I'm happy to talk more about uh, this, this trial as well uh, in the discussion. Koya, Koya is a company that started by, by Stan Rappel. And originally uh, Stan and, and the group, and they published this in the Lancet, took stem cells from the blood, and these are T cells or T reg cells from the blood. They expanded them in, in, the, in the petri dish, and then they transplant and then they transfuse them back into the patient. And these T regs are very, uh, they, they're anti inflammatory, like massive dose of ibuprofen. They're going to dampen down inflammation. And Stan has got great data showing that inflammation outside of the brain and the blood can actually affect the brain itself and progression of the disease. So this was exciting. Uh, they called it COIA 101. And they were going to go into a clinical trial, a bigger trial with these cells, because the first trial looked good. And then they discovered that they didn't need to actually grow the cells outside of the body. If they gave a low dose of IL-2, which is a, a, a cytokine, they gave the patient IL-2, uh, they could actually modify and increase the Tregs without having to inject them into the patient. That's great. And then they combined that with CTLA-4, which actually has a, also a, knocks out some of the bad cells, these pro-inflammatory macrophages, so they now have this combined therapy approach, which is very exciting. And this is under this is now under a clinical trial, undergoing clinical trial by COIA, and uh, maybe more effective than growing the cells out of the body and putting it back in. 
And then finally, this is just on the stem cell side, uh, there's these things called exosomes. We used to think the, the, the effect of mesenchymal cells, and, and again, the effects of mesenchymal cells are usually 20 to 30% slowing of the disease. They're not replacing neurons or astrocytes in the brain. But some of the effects may have been through exosomes. And exosomes, you'll hear about exosomes are little pieces that pinch off of Treg cells or any cell. And inside them, there's these magic uh, compounds like nucleic acids and lipids and RNAs that seem to be therapeutic. It's a very exciting area. And Coya is now developing exosomes, as are many companies, because it's not a cell itself. It's just tiny little blobs of cellular product that you can infuse into a patient. So watch out. This field is growing very fast and it's kind of related to stem cells. And what we need now is some good clinical trials to see how exosomes may work in patients. So just to summarize, these approaches use non-brain um, cells. They're using basically stem cells from the blood or exosomes, and it's mainly modulating inflammation in the periphery for coya. Um, even brainstorm was modulating uh, the inflammation in the actual CSF, but not directly in the brain. And the evidence for that's not very good. Um, and we don't know what the downstream effects are of modulating in the CSF or in the blood. But what about cells that can actually go in and replace neurons and astrocytes uh, within the nervous tissue. And that's kind of where I'm going to finish up. And just, you can go back to my talk of a couple of years ago, uh, where I really went through all of the details. And that's why I want to save time today and just really give you a, a, a high level summary of what we've been doing uh, at Cedar sinai for the, for the transplants and really following on from some great work from Emory many years ago, Nick Boulis, Jonathan Glass, but with a different twist on, on the therapeutic approach that we're taking. Uh, and now you should be experts now. I've already told you about embryonic stem cells, um, induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, and there's, of course, fetal tissue that you can also get stem cells from. And, and one of the advantages of fetal brain tissue is that the brain is developed normally up to the fetal stage. And if you remove cells from there and expand them, they actually know what they're doing a little better because they've been trained to be neural. And you can get progenitors out from those as well. Now, what we want to do then is turn those progenitors into either a neuron, an oligodendrocyte, or an astrocyte. The neurons are very important. As you know, in motor neurons in ALS are very important. They connect to the muscle. And the oligodendrocytes, these are remyelinating. They're important for MS. But the cell I'm going to talk about is this astrocyte. And the reason I'm going to talk about the astrocyte is that the astrocyte actually is very easy to make. Um, and what the astrocyte does is supports the neurons. It's like a nurse in a hospital. Doctors are great, but you really need the nurses to support the patient. Think of the astrocyte as a nurse that's supporting the motor neuron that's dying. Now, if you put a healthy astrocyte in, you might be able to support that motor neuron for longer. And that was a hypothesis we had a number of years ago. Um, I just like this picture. Uh, this is showing an astrocyte in blue, a nice happy astrocyte that supports motor neurons, and the red angry astrocytes over here. And sometimes in disease, the astrocyte gets a little angry or dysfunctional and then it can't support the motion neuron. So we want to make more of these non-angry astrocytes and put them into the brain. This is what they look like inside the brain. It's a labeled astrocyte. Every one of these red fibers is from the astrocyte. And these fibers go out, touch neurons and protect them. Now there's some of these astrocytes are being used in a way that uh, is uh, not initially intuitive because they're putting these astrocytes just like re just like brainstorm, they're putting these astrocytes into the cerebral spinal fluid through a lumbar puncture, not into the brain tissue. Um, so delivered by CSF, and they'll be again restricting and changing the CSF biology. There's a company here in Israel that's been uh, Kadi Um That trial is, I think, still going. Uh, it's a small trial, and we'll be seeing if it has any effects. And these astrocytes might have an effect like the mesenchymal cell in the CSF and modify CSF function. But we've been really focused on astrocytes uh, in the spinal cord. And again, I'm going to go high level just in the last 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes, and talk to you about where we're at with this. And again, it was only, it was only a couple of years ago that uh, I did this talk. And I pulled the slides out and made sure I didn't reproduce too much of what I did the last time. So everything I've told you up until now has been new. Uh, this was what I did last time. It tells you what we're trying to do. Um, this is the intact nervous system. Here's your motor neuron. It's attached to your muscle. I've strip everything away. Uh, normally there's obviously, that's the spinal cord here, um, and that's your muscle. And this is these are all the uh, nerve tracks that go out into your muscle. But just to make you, just to sort of strip everything away and see what really happens. And our astrocyte sits here that really protects the motor neuron. When it goes wrong, what happens is the motor neuron gets sick 
And now it detaches from the muscle. So you lose the ability to move because the motor neurons sick. And this is at the spinal cord level, at least, we think what happens is something happens. We don't know what triggers that death of the motor neuron, to be frank. That's what we're trying to understand with our disease modeling in iPS cells, but it dies and it undergoes degeneration. And this also compromises other things like the blood-brain barrier because the astrocyte end feet will, if you go back to a healthy astrocyte, these end feet stick on the blood vessels and they, they control blood flow. And that's the part I'm trying to model. If you remember from the organ chip system, we're trying to model this whole part of the system to understand more about what goes wrong when the astrocyte goes. Now, our goal is here is to put an astrocyte transplant and that is that the astrocyte, we put it back in. Uh, there's some evidence just come out from Steve Golden's lab that these astrocytes might be able to actually uh, kill off the host astrocytes and replace them with new ones, which is really exciting. Now, once you've got that astrocyte in place, as long as this motor neuron is still and has a some function, uh, it might improve the function. So you see here, it's uh, disconnected from the muscle. And now once we put the astrocyte in, the hope is it's healthy enough that it can regrow another axon out to the muscle and restore some function, or at least stop it from degenerating any further. Through a lot of work that we've done, we've noticed that the astrocytes are good. They can do something in, in these model, animal models, um, but we didn't really get the power that we wanted. And so we turbocharged these astrocytes by engineering them to make GDNF. GDNF is a, a growth factor you can't get across the blood-brain barrier, but when you get these astrocytes to make GDNF, they uh, secrete it. And now that's gonna give a double whammy for the motor neuron. It gets GDNF, which is, by the way, the same factor that the neuron cells make, the mesenchymal cells, they make GDNF in the CSF. The difference now is we're gonna put these cells right into the spinal cord that make GDNF and make new astrocytes. I told you we get this from fetal tissue, this product, uh, it's fetal brain. We expand it, we engineer it with a virus to make GDNF, and now we have our product, which are astrocytes secreting GDNF. And that's the, the clinical product that we have called uh, CNS10 GDNF. Uh, we've recently, and I won't go into details, adapted this whole model now just in the last couple of years to do this from iPS cells. So, so we no longer need to use fetal tissue. We've now managed to make the same cells using iPS technology. We can make these GDNF secreting astrocyte progenitors uh, completely uh, without using uh, fetal tissue, which is important. However, for the clinical trials that I'm going to talk about, we're still using fetal tissue. because That's what the FDA has approved. And we have to move these cells now through all of the FDA approval processes before we can use them in patients. This is the approach uh, in ALS, as you know, the two motor neurons that are lost, the upper motor neuron that projects all the way down with one circuit, which is the longest, longest uh, connection in, in the universe for uh, motor neurons, at least, except maybe in the elephant, the whale, uh, but certainly the, one of the longest connections of any one cable, all the way down to this lower motor neuron here shown in the spinal cord, and then this is the spinal cord motor neuron, the second motor neuron that dies in ALS that goes to the muscle. So we have two motor neurons that die in ALS, upper motor neuron, and then this lower motor neuron. So the challenge when we started this, where do we start? Well, the FDA made that easy. They said, if you're going to do a clinical trial, start in the lower area, because if something goes wrong, that's not going to cause too much of a problem. And in fact, if you can start just on one side and test this, this whole idea, then that would be good as well. I'm not going to go through all the data. If you look at my other talk, I do a lot of details on, on what we do, what we did here. Um, or you can go read this paper. It's a little heavy, to be frank, but we put everything into this paper, the preclinical studies, the trial itself, the outcomes, the problems that we had, um, and it's all, it's all wrapped up in one paper. Bottom line, guys, is that we can deliver cells, and this is this gray stain here is, is the protein GDNF that the cells are really making. So this is evidence that the cells survived for up to four years. They produce GDNF. And in some cases, we hit the target perfectly. This is the, the lower, this is the motor neuron area of the spinal cord, and this is a post-mortem case came to us. So we can deliver the cells. They can release GDNF. And the uh, effect was positive. So this is just muscle strength. We only put the cells on one side of the leg. And again, go see my other talk for all the details. But we found the leg that the cells, the side of the spinal cord we put the cells on, we measured the strength in that leg, was always a little better. It didn't quite reach significance, especially at the high dose, but it was always a little better. Above the line, it's good here. It means the leg we treated is stronger than the leg we didn't. Always a little better, uh, especially at the end of 12 months here. It was a one-year trial. And the idea here was just to show safety. That's all we wanted to do in this trial because it's very complicated. We have to do surgery. We, we have to put the cells in. And so at this point, uh, we're thinking and, and in the process of recruiting some more patients, a small cohort, and we, we 
actually got better ways now to target to get the right spot. We learned so much from this paper, this trial. So we now know how to target the right spot. And we're going to go a little earlier in progression because this is a protective strategy. So we want patients at a slightly earlier stage of progression. Um, and, and with the targeting then, we can see if it has a stronger effect on outcomes over time and have more numbers where we can actually get some statistics to see if we're having an effect on progression. But this is very promising because we've shown the cells can survive, they're safe, and now uh, we're allowed to move forward. So the last <clears throat> few, few slides I'll show you um, is this part, which is the, uh, where we, we've got two different areas. We've got the lumbar, which is legs, we've got cervical, which is breathing and arms, and we can definitely go there. We haven't got plans quite yet, but uh, it's possible to do transplants in the cervical. We actually jump to the upper motor neuron because I'm very worried that we won't really see an effect down here because you need to activate the lower motor neuron. So what if we were actually doing quite well protecting our lower motor neuron, but the upper motor neuron was dying and so we're not seeing any effect. To me, that made a lot of logical sense. And why waste all that time protecting the lower motor neuron if the upper one is required to make it, to make it fire? And so I really forced my attention back into the upper motor neuron and without, again, this is all in the other talk, um, but ultimately we showed that we could put these cells in the upper motor neuron in animal models and protect uh, against cell death. And in fact, when we did it in animal models, it worked better in our animal models when we put the cells in the motor cortex than if we put them in the spinal cord. We can actually protect the spinal cord motor, motor neurons by putting the cells in the upper area. The upper motor neurons are amazing. Uh, there's an area here called the hand knob. This is a homunculus in the motor cortex strip. And this homunculus means we can target different parts of the body by putting the stem cells just in here in the hand knob. So all we expect to see in this case is an effect on the hand. Now, if we show this is safe and it works in the hand, we can put cells up and down this motor strip to protect legs, arms, and face movement, speech, et cetera. Um, and that's a very exciting potential, but we have to get safety in a small area first. And that was really what this trial was designed for. We picked the hand knob because we have good outcome measures for hand strength. And patients would love to keep the hand strength, obviously, even if it's just on one side. So that's where we started. Uh, this is an open trial, guys. So this is undergoing now. We're recruiting patients. Uh, I'll give you the information uh, when, when I'm finished. Uh, the PI is Rich Lewis, who's a fantastic clinician at Cedar sinai Adam Mamalak is an outstanding surgeon, a neurosurgeon. And Pablo Avalos is coordinating the trial. And I'm the sponsor. It's paid for by a wonderful state, California Institute for Agenda Medicine. I haven't mentioned, but I will at the end. They're funding all of this work. And uh, the CERN, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, Prop 14, five and a half billion dollars for stem cell research in the state of California has allowed me to do everything I've told you up until now in the clinical trial arena. So we're very, very happy to be supported and funded by CERN. Now, I think patients often think of brain surgery as quite daunting. Uh, I actually, actually, the brain surgery is more standard for neurosurgeons than spinal cord surgery. So, so from our point of view, designing this trial, it was actually easier thinking about it in, in the cortex because things like in Parkinson's, you get this uh, treatment called DBS, deep brain stimulation. And many, many patients have had this around the world. Hundreds, thousands of patients have had it. It's a small craniotomy and, and they uh, put an electrode in. So we do the same kind of craniotomy in a, and we just pick the region, the neurosurgeons pick the region above where the motor neurons are that are dying in ALS. And then we put the cells in, we uh, designed this, so we just transplant the cells into the motor cortex. And then you do a very simple measure of outcome, uh, hand grip strength, you've probably all done dynotry, dynotry to measure grip strength. Uh, we put you in the atlas to, to measure uh, the strength of legs and arms, right and left. And we only put the cells on one side of the brain because we wanna see a unilateral effect. And then we measure hand function over time in each patient. And the question is, if we put the cells in and they protect the motor neurons, Will the hand strength on the treated side stray strong uh, compared to the other side? And if we see a remarkable effect, we'll be allowed to do a crossover, which is then we'll go treat the other side as well. Uh, this is a very, very innovative trial. It's very new um, and uh, we've, we're very excited about it. The first two patients shows you here that we've got cells surviving, uh, not surviving, excuse me. We've got cells delivered in this white area is right over the hand knob. So we put the cells successfully into the motor cortex um, so far, uh, so good with the trial. It's ongoing, so I can't tell you a lot of the uh, details, um, but the trial is, is going forward well. The patients have uh, gone home. And these, this trial is kind of interesting, as is the spinal cord, in that you, there isn't a drug you have to take. The cells go in, and they make the GDNF, and then you go home. So, so it's what we call a one-and-done, if you like. 
that the cells go in and you don't, then there's no other infusions into the CSF. There's nothing else that the patient has to undergo. The only thing is, is you have to have immune suppression because this is an allogeneic transplant. So to be super safe, uh, we will give you immune suppression for the first year of the trial. And then after that, you can remove the suppression. And we now know from our spinal cord trial that the cells can survive fine without suppression after one year, but we still are being cautious and adding immune suppression to you uh, to keep the cells alive. This is unilateral, as I mentioned. We treated the first patient last year. We're still treating, we're still recruiting. Uh, we have got postmortem tissue from two patients. Uh, and I'm very excited to tell you actually, just now uh, we found that says we have cell survival in the motor cortex. So we can see the cells surviving. We don't know if they're making GDNF yet. That is happening in the lab as I speak. We're trying to figure out, did they make GDNF? But this has been uh, quite remarkable that we've managed to find the cells in the motor cortex. Uh, and we're very excited that that's a positive effect for the trial that, that uh, we haven't announced yet. Um, so we're excited to see that. But we are still recruiting. If, you're, if you want any information on this trial, uh, please contact either myself uh, or Pablo Avalos at CSINI, uh, CSHS.org, and we can send you that information. Uh, the trial is open, uh, and we're very uh, keen on having people uh, recruited in. And we just recently talked a lot about, you know, your options in ALS. Um, and we do understand this is this is quite an invasive trial. Um, and ob obviously, we're just targeting a very small part of the body. So we've actually decided to open it up to we, the inclusion criteria was originally two years. Uh, you had to have had ALS for a, a minimum of three years, and no, no longer, because we wanted a little bit earlier time, but we've now opened it up to four years. Uh, we're about to open it up for four years uh, pending IRB approval so that we can recruit patients who are a little further on and perhaps don't have so many options in other trials. Uh, and that way we can open it up to, to later stage patients. Um, and I think that's very important to get the concept and get the cells, understand how the cells work uh, and move this trial forward. So to, just to thank everybody, I'm sorry I've been a little longer than I, I usually have. But I wanted to go slow to describe everything for you all. Uh, this is the group that did all the in vitro work and the chip work. Uh, this is the work that did the group that did the trial and hats off to Pat Johnson for the original trial. Uh, and I do want to point out Pablo, Pablo Avalos, who's been behind uh, a lot of the, everything I've told you. And then my wife, Shana, actually wrote the IMD uh, with us, uh, which is four and a half thousand pages. And I always say this a little blur here is my daughter, Nicole, who somehow slipped into the dinner. She's good at doing that. Um, and at Cedars, we have an amazing team. We are, we talked about ALS clinics earlier on in, in California. We had these uh, ALS Golden West chapter clinics and we are one of those clinics. Uh, and we do everything from pulmonology uh, all the way through to basic uh, care of the patient. But we integrated that with all our OR staff, operation staff to do this neurosurgery. Uh, you can be confident you're in an amazing, amazing place at Cedar Sinai, number two hospital in the country now um, to do this kind of surgery and do this kind of innovative trial. And as soon as we get positive effects here, we want to open this up and, and get other sites and, 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 and grow it. So for, most of all, out of everything, I want to thank the patients who, who have participated, not in, in the first trial, but also in the, in the new trial, because it's, it's, your, it's your ability to enter these trials. And we're very open and, and honest on the consenting that this is a, more of a research trial than a treatment trial. Um, but through your participation, we can learn how can we get these cells in and protect motor neurons as soon as we get that safety data, then we can open it up uh, and expand the trial and get to more and more patients. And, and I really, really hope this will help with ALS. But I'm a scientist. We're testing whether it works or not. And, and my job is to do that test as thoroughly as we can. If we get a signal and it's working, that's when we get very excited. And we're still in the process of understanding, uh, do we have that single signal to take it to the FDA and take it to the next level? I'll stop there and uh, open up for questions. Thank you. We have, thank you. We have a lot of questions in the chat. So if you wouldn't mind adding those questions to the chat, Casey and I will ask and get some answers for you. And if you'd like to ask your own question, just throw your hand up. All right, Casey, you want to ask the first? We'll start with the first question. It was, can living and dead motor neurons be harvested from living patients compare, to compare and study? No. You can't get neurons from a living patient. So unfortunately, from a, from a post-mortem patient, from a patient who just died, uh, you can get biopsies from epilepsy patients where they have a resection, but we don't want to go in and take any live neurons out of the brain from a living patient. That's why we use these uh, IPS technology to generate your neurons in the dish. Thank you. And Maureen has a question. And Maureen's question is, will these treatments cure ALS? 
put it into remission or just give the patient more time in terms of months? And that is exactly what we're testing. The, the answer is this is brand new. If I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be giving these talks. I'd be putting these cells in over if it, if it was going to cure ALS. Uh, I, think we're, I think what we're trying to do is discover the first part. Does it, does it prolong ALS? Does it, does it slow progression? Um, and what would be wonderful is if we looked at the hand that was treated and, of course, you know, that, that stayed really stable and the other hand kept getting worse because we haven't treated it. The reason it's wonderful is we know that we have a strong effect. And then everybody get excited and then we can do more patients to prove that it really works. So that's how I'm seeing this trial. It's a very early stage, but very exciting. Our next question was emailed over and it's what type of stem cells have the most benefits, embryonic or stem cells from an adult? Uh, that's a loaded question in the, you know, it depends on what you're looking at. Now, if you have a disease that involves a lot of peripheral problems, um, and maybe ALS does have a lot of peripheral problems, then maybe Stanapel's idea of putting, of modulating inflammation and putting blood cells in is very powerful. So that could be great. Now, if, if it's not the case, maybe we need to put cells directly into the brain because that's where we need to get them. In that case, embryonic stem cells and cells that make astrocytes and neurons are more powerful. So I would just, I would turn the question around and say, let's use the cell that we show in good controlled clinical trials with good ideas and hypotheses. Let's use a cell that works in our first in our animal models and then in small patient trials and we'll, we'll work it out. But it's, as I told you, it's complicated. There's different types of stem cell and not everyone is gonna work for every disease. We have to figure that out, just like drugs. Thank you. Um, our next question. Would you expect to see differences between IPSCs from an asymptomatic carrier versus a symptomatic carrier? That's a great question. And if you have C9 off, you can be a carrier, obviously. And the answer is no. I think, I think in our model, regardless of whether you, you haven't got the disease yet or you do have the disease, if you're carrying the C9 off mutation, I think mm -hmm. we have the same results. We should see something different. The theory is that that C9 off mutation or the repeats in that, in that gene are causing ALS, doesn't matter whether you've got it yet, we want to see if our motor neurons get it in the dish. So you could be pre-symptomatic or fully symptomatic, it shouldn't make a difference. Our next question is, have you heard of a trial in Toronto that uses focus ultrasound to deliver stem cells through the blood-brain barrier? Yes, I have, and it's a nice idea. And we, we, we were, we're trying to test that out as well. So the idea here, guys, is you, you do a little ultrasound. So what so if you put our cells into the circulation, they don't get into the brain. But if you put our cells in the circulation and then you, then you zap part of the brain with ultrasound, it opens up the blood-brain barrier and cells might be able to get in. Now, it's a great concept. It's being tried. I'm waiting to see the data to see if it really works and what types of cells we can get into the brain using that technology. But keep an eye on that. So it's one of these fantastic technologies that are flying around. Uh, we just have to prove that they actually can work across labs and, and then get it into a clinical trial. Okay, so I have a comment and then a question. Eric, um, I wanted to read his comment. He said, I call this hope. Um, so that was his I comment. Do as well. Okay. And then the question is from Faith that says, any possibility we can get a copy of the slides? I'm very happy to send a copy. I don't know, in, I think this stays up so you can yeah. replay it, but I'm, I'm also happy to send a copy of the slides. There's nothing confidential in here that, that I, I'm worried about. Yeah, we have this as a YouTube, you know, channel in our YouTube channel as a video. So, yeah. Next question is, is one of the reasons you are targeting astrocytes to increase the uptake of glutamate and to improve glutamate homeostasis? Yeah, great. Yes. Yes is the answer. You know, astrocytes do a lot of things. There's a whole hypothesis. Now, all of these in ALS, to be frank, are hypothesis, which means we don't know if they're right or not, but it's something that somebody said. This could be the reason we get ALS. One is overexcitability. Too much release of glutamate is killing the motor neurons. Excitotoxicity is called. And the astrocytes are amazing in that they suck up this glutamate from around the synaptic junction. So the concept is if you put a new astrocyte in, you might suck up more glutamate and, and reduce toxicity. Um, again, hypothesis, we have to try and prove it. And it's very tough in, so this gets back to models, guys. And we don't have a good model of ALS, uh, to be honest, in animals, which is why we try and use iPS cells. 
And so if we had better models to test all this and, and we had cell death in the dish, we'd be able to answer a lot of these questions. We're almost there, like I said, from my modeling part, but not quite reliable enough yet to replace uh, the, the only animal model we have really that's reliable is, this, is the SOD1 model still after all these years. But yeah, glutamate uptake would be a, one of the functions. They release things as well. The astrocytes pump out lots of different cytokines and signals. And that was one of Brainstorm's points for the mesenchymal cells as well. They release a lot of factors that could be protective. Now, again, we don't understand that very well, or which factors are the most important, et cetera, but those are ideas. So yes, uptake of glutamate could be, could be important. Okay, I have a question from Tori. On the postmortem brains, how did the patients die? And did the transplants work as hoped? So patients, unfortunately, just came to us through, you know, uh, people passed away from ALS. Um, we had a very um, good group of patients that consented to donate uh, the tissues. And so the tissues were collected and that's how that's how the, we got the tissues. Um, and, you know, the... the Postmortem data is showing that the cells can survive in the spinal cord of a patient and now in the brain of a patient is very encouraging. And so now we can also look around where the cells are and look at the motor neurons and see how healthy they are. Uh, we did that in the spinal cord and in the cases where we had cells, uh, motor neurons around the area of the transplant, we couldn't, we couldn't detect anything significant in terms of the motor neuron health. But again, these were a little bit later stage patients and we're actually still working on that. We have collaborators in England who's still looking through those spinal cord transplants to understand is there a relationship between the neuron and the GDNF and the astrocytes. So we're still working on that. We just wanted to publish the first paper on the, out the overall outcomes, but we have a lot more to learn about how the cells are interacting in the postmortem tissues. Alex wanted to ask if you have a timeline of when the next phase of the GDNF secreting cell trial might take place. Yeah, now. Uh, we're, we're, the cortical trial is underway. Uh, the spinal cord trial, it's very complicated, guys, because we have an investigation on new drug to do the cortical study. And if we do another spinal cord patient and something happened, we would have to stop the cortical study because it's the same cell product. And so we're just waiting a little bit till we get further on in the cortical study to redo the spinal study with, with better targeting and, as I mentioned, uh, an early, a little bit earlier progression. The ultimate goal, guys, is to do both. The, the both is to do spinal cord, and then uh, two weeks later you get the motor cortex done because now you're protecting both parts of the circuit, and that's when we should start to see really strong effects if this technology is working. And again, I, the big if is we have to show it works partially in the motor cortex and also in the spinal cord, and then FDA will allow us to do both sites, which that'll be very exciting when we get to that stage. Uh, we're working our way there and it's going on now. Okay, and Tori has another question. Tori wants to know how soon before these stem cell therapies will be available to patients realistically? Yeah, scientists are the worst at, at estimating time and, and and the reason is science doesn't move in a nice, okay, you know, in two years, I'll have a great discovery. And then in three years, I'll put that into the patient. It usually goes that something could happen tomorrow, why I love science. Something could happen tomorrow where we discover something that could make a huge impact that what I said today is going to take 10 years, takes, takes one year. So you have to just think about the logistics of science and research and how it works. I, I think the timeline for this is very clear for us. We have a, another year and a half and we're recruiting into this cortical trial. And after we get, once we recruit this study, we'll be able to tell if it's having an effect. That might be two years from now. And if it's a strong effect, we'll go straight into a phase two, larger phase two study to really, really nail that, that this effect's working and get more patients, more sites. So, so we've got about a year's, two years uh, runway here, depending on how we get on with recruitment in the cortex. Thank you. And I know you're running over. Is it okay if we ask some more questions or do you need those questions emailed? So many people are interested in this, but we want to respect your time. Well, the, uh, I'll stay on a few minutes. Um, but happy to talk a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we have our next question is um, from Kristen, not me. The other Kristen asks, is it possible that participation in your trial would exclude a patient from participating in other trials? Yeah, there are some exclusions. And uh, if you have our trial, then some other trials won't include 
you because you're in a stem cell trial. So it's very dependent on each particular trial. So you can talk to our advice. If you call the clinic and you talk to uh, Pablo and to our clinical team, they will give you all that information. Next question is, what about targeting other glial cells? Yeah, it's a good question. And oligodendrocytes, I see in the chat there. That's what I mentioned. That those are the cells that myelinate. And it's possible oligodendrocytes are affected in ALS as well. We're focusing on the astrocyte because it's very uh, straightforward. It's You can target right around the motor neurons. Um, uh, but ultimately, yeah, we could try and repair some of the oligodendrocyte damage. I, I honestly think that I, I don't know where ALS starts, but if it's a motor neuron disease and it starts in the motor neuron, the death of the oligodendrocyte might be secondary to the to the motor neuron dying because now it has nothing to myelinate, so the axon will die, and now the myelin goes and the oligodendrocyte goes. So my view is to try and stop that motor neuron from dying in the first place, and whether in sheathing in a, in a myelin sheath will help it or not depends on what's causing its death. So, so a lot of work to do. I'm not against oligodendrocytes. I'd love to have enough money and bandwidth to do an oligodendrocyte progenitor trial. There's a guy called Steve Goldman who's fantastic doing oligodendrocyte progenitor trials for multiple sclerosis. And, you know, that's a, you can go into the lesion and actually transplant oligos to patch up the lesion. Now, finally, in ALS, there isn't a huge amount of demyelination like in multiple sclerosis. We don't see it on the MRI image. So, you know, the question is, where would you put your oligodendrocytes, right? But there is a massive loss and shrinkage of that motor cortex, and we know that's where the main damage is. So that's why we're focusing our attention there. Okay. Um, another question. Does this research include PLS, and will this help PLAS? Yeah, we, we'd love to be able to include PLS uh, and other forms of, you know, and PLS and primary lateral sclerosis, you know, involves just the upper motor neuron rather than the whole system. Uh, there's also just the lower motor neuron. Right now, we're we're focusing just on general ALS, so you have to have some loss of both upper and lower for the trial in inclusion criteria, but um, we wish we could take PLS patients as well. But this trial is, is just for ALS, where you have to have some involvement in both. However, we're, you know, we, we are, I say, flexible, but we might, if somebody had PLS, they could call the clinic and just see because it's very difficult to get pure PLS, to be honest. So you might want to, if you had it, call the clinic, see what they say, because they're the ones who will make the decision on enrollment. I'm the sponsor, um, but the PI, Rich Lewis and his team are the ones who decide on who enrolls in the trial and, and they do the consenting. So I would call the clinic if you have a, if you, if you're not sure if you're eligible, just call the clinic. Next question is regarding glutamate. Um, Glutamate or glutamic acid is extremely neurotoxic, and then many athletic people have ALS. Has there been an association with their glutamate protein supplements? That's a, that's a great question. Glutamate is the, the most ironic molecule, right? Because we need glutamate. I mean, glutamate is called a neurotransmitter. It's what, it's what connects your muscles to your neuron. Your neuron fires because it's received an input in glutamate input from the motor cortex. So we need glutamate to fire that neuron. The neuron in the spinal cord to the muscle then releases another transmitter called acetylcholine, and that makes your muscle twitch. But you need glutamate. I would be paralyzed right now if I didn't have glutamate functioning. So we need glutamate for signaling. It's part of the whole synaptic part. Now, if it goes wrong and you get too much glutamate, excited tox toxicity means the neuron's literally overexcited. It's firing too much. And so we might just want to try and dial down the glutamate, modify it to, under, to, to try and slow down some of this overfiring. But if we dialed it down completely, you would be paralyzed because we need glutamate to activate the motion arm. All right. So it's not as simple as just eliminating glutamate. Uh, that's why we're struggling with drugs, because if you mess with the glutamate system too much with the drug, you will cause paralysis. <laughs> uh, so it's a complex system we're, we're working with. And if you guys wouldn't mind checking, Indus put some information in the chat, um, a number, and then a link to the um, Cedar sauna website. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing that. I should have probably done that as well. But feel free to call me or uh, email me directly or Pablo Avalos if I gave that email. Maybe you could put his in the chat if you can find uh, Pablo Avalos at cshs.org. 
and uh, you know he, he can help as well if you have any questions because we're very very keen uh, to to enroll this study and uh, but we do want patients who are fully consented we want to make sure you know what you're going into so we will explain every last aspect of the trial so that you're not sidelined by anything because I, I think that's what informed consent means to me is <laughs> informing you of this trial all right thank you Thank you. It looks like that's all of the questions and comments. Michael Thayer, was there something you wanted to say, Michael? You're on mute. You're on mute, Michael. You're still on mute, my friend. Okay, we need to go and go ahead and. Okay. We'll catch up with you, Michael. Michael, drop me an email. I'll uh, try and get back to you. I know what the finding the mute button is the hardest thing to do. <laughs> there okay. he is. Michael, what do you want to say? Okay. Clive, great presentation. I wanted to ask you, if you have the C9, does it fix the C9 or just the motor neuron disease? And if it repairs the motor neuron disease with your protocol, does the C9 overtake it again, or do you have to actually fix the genetic, uh, the genetic marker, like the biomarker? Yeah, thanks like, for does, the question. Yeah, does yeah. the technology fix one or the other, or does it just work in combination? So we don't know, Mike, good question. Uh, we don't exclude C9 patients from the trial because we don't know this growth factor astrocyte replacement could work for, for C9 motor neuron disease as well. There's no reason why, why it shouldn't. Um, I think logically for C9, we're really, really hoping, obviously, that there's a genetic approach with CRISPR or ASO antisense oligos that could eventually correct mutation. Because if you have C9 repeats in the C9 gene, at least you know what's causing your ALS. Um, and so okay. that's, you can do a targeted therapy. So the most patients that enter our trial have sporadic ALS where they don't know the mutation because it makes, to me, more sense. They have nothing, really, because we don't know what's causing it. Whereas C9, you might say, well, let's see if the next ASO trial does better because I know what's targeting it. However, having said all that, you could be waiting for years, right? Huntington's disease, we've known the genetic mutation in Huntington's disease now for 30 years. We still don't have a gene therapy or antisense oligo or any sort of treatment for Huntington's disease. So just knowing the mutation doesn't mean there's a magic cure around the corner. It means that we can target, but that's why we allow patients who have C9 to enter the trial if they, if they understand that you know, this is a different option, but it could work for C9 if it's going to work at all, as well as for sporadic ALS, correct? Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Clive. All right. Well, look, thanks, uh, Indu. Thanks, everybody, for the invite. Very excited to be back. And uh, maybe in three years, I'll be back again. <laughs> yes. We hope it's before that, Clive, but we're rooting for you and your brilliant mind and what you do for ALS community. We are really grateful. Thanks so much, Indu. And I've really, well, we'll keep pushing. We're all pushing for you guys and just trying to solve this problem. It's uh, it's an immense problem, uh, but it's solvable, I think. And uh, things like the everything ALS and what Indu is doing is actually incredibly important. You guys are part of the solution. And, and the way you all work together, I think is fantastic. And this program, Indu, is just making a huge difference. I even get some of my friends coming to these. I saw Ben Brooks came on for a while. And he's I worked with him in Wisconsin so many years ago. And, it's kind of fun that you can get to this big audience through through this uh, fantastic webinar you set up. So, so congratulations. All right. I've heard other researchers say this is how they get to know what everybody's doing. So um, I'm glad. Yeah, they sneak in. Yeah, yeah, they like, they sneak what in. I like. And above all, they, they do like all the uh, questions that the people community, you know, the people with ALS and the community are asking. So I think uh, that's a big draw. We're always learning from from everybody in the community because you yeah. guys have a lot of good, fantastic questions. I'm always listening. So yeah, all right, Thank great. You. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a great Bye day.